Russell Smith, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So uh, you wrote a book, came out about three years ago, called Men's Style, The Thinking Man's Guide to Dress. And it's really, it's one of the most inf- information-packed book on style, but also the most well-written book. It's just a lot of fun to read. But I'm curious, because you, you, you highlight this in your book, that growing up, you were part of the, the punk rock scene. So I imagine there was a lot of studded... <laughs> denim jackets with yeah. sleeves ripped off and you know all <laughs> yeah. you know ran, you know rancid patches you know sewn on and whatnot <laughs> and then now you're a writer so you probably work from home you don't have to get dressed up technically you could exactly. lounge around in your underwear so i'm yeah. curious how did this interest in high men's style and fashion uh get started well first of all about punk rock i mean that was primarily a fashion interest i mean i think punk rock was primarily an aesthetic movement it was really a uh a movement about a new aesthetic, a movement in fashion. I don't really think it was a, particularly not in, in the UK, which is the movement that influenced me the most. Uh, uh, not really a, a political or ideological movement. Um, uh, so I came to punk rock through fashion, uh, really. Um, but I'll tell you, my background is interesting. My father is a university professor of English. My mother, uh, they met at Oxford in the 1950s, and she was a noted beauty. And uh, so she always had an interest in clothes to look good. So I grew up with these two influences in my home. My house had a subscription to the Times Literary Supplement and Vogue. Those were the two biggest influences in my life. And my dad was always fascinated by the minutiae of men's clothing. Not so much fashion as convention. You know, convention in men's fashion is so much more important than it is in women's fashion. Uh, the convention, convention of how to do things properly and as a gentleman should are so riven with class conventions uh, and military traditions. Um, those things are actually at odds with fashion, and they 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 keep hold men's clothing back against fashion. My dad, he was from South Africa, which is where I was born, and he um, went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and so was slightly outside. The, the privileged classes at Oxford had a different accent, a colonial accent, and really had to learn these conventions of proper uh, gentleman's behavior in a place that was highly class conscious. So he learned all these these conventions of the right dinner jacket, the right way to lace your shoes, to button your jackets, um, the right kinds of suspenders, what to call the, the, uh, uh, the third piece of your suit and how to pronounce it. And he taught all those things to me as a child. So I grew up fascinated by these things. Interesting. And you, I guess the punk rock thing was just like, a, you're going to rebel against that? Was that... Well, it was rebellion. No, really, it was all part of that. You know, for me, punk rock was rebelling against blandness. Punk rock was a way of being a peacock um, and and standing out. Uh, so it was really just another manifestation of fashion. And after punk rock, as a very young man, I went through all the different post-punk new wave manifestations of different fashions, you know, rockabilly and ska yeah. and goth and new romantic. I had long hair and makeup and... Um, and scarves. Uh, those were those were all just different expressions of different forms of flamboyance, really. Right. Yeah. I think Sorry, I don't dress like that anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting. You, you make the point about how uh, even people who in the punk rock scene were are very fashion conscious because I guess yeah. the general. Um, idea out there from the you know, most public is like, oh, they don't care what they look like is a look at them. Oh God. But, yeah. Not, well, in the, in the 1970s, it was very much about how you look. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, even when I, you know, I was, uh, I, I was in high school in the nineties and I, I was sort of in dabbled in the punk ska scene. And I remember just seeing like people, these kids, like how much time they would spend like studying their jacket or like yeah. getting the patches right. So I mean, they, it, it looked like they didn't care, but no, they really cared a lot. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so in the book, you you make the case that style and caring about dressing well, um, at least for men, gets attacked or is held in suspect by both people who would call themselves conservative socially or liberal or progressive. Right. Um, so what are the respective criticisms, and how do you counter those? Well, it's funny. It's pretty much the same from the left and the right. The the, the, the right says that. Um, it is uncool, uh, unmanly to pay attention to your clothing, that it's effeminate. Um, that's what a social conservative would think. Um, and uh, uh, a leftist thinks that it is frivolous, that it is not serious, that um, it's... Uh, 
uh, evidence of a wastefulness, a wasteful kind of thinking, um, and uh, and uh, um, again, evidence of a lack of seriousness. Um, we have this convention in our society, and this is pretty recent. It's only in really in 20th century society um, that a man should um, uh, be valued only on what he does and not on how he appears, and that any kind of training or flamboyant appearance uh, makes him seem less serious and less powerful. Um, that's really a blip in history, in the history of men's clothing. Men, especially powerful men, have signaled their power through finery, right through human history. And even the most macho of warriors, military men, have the most flamboyant uniforms, uh, you know, think of, of, of uh, you know, plumed helmets and uh, uh, um, uh, red uniforms and um, all the different uh, gold braid that goes into to military uniforms. Um, those are those those are the really the most flamboyant outfits of all, or those are the most macho men. Um, think of kings um, and and nobles showing off their status with silk and lace and, and finery. It really wasn't until the rise of democracy in the 19th century um, that men uh, began to try to appear as if they were below their social station. It was uh, something of a liability after the French Revolution in Europe to go around proclaiming aristocratic status. Um, and it became more fashionable to appear to be a commoner. And that's when the rise of the uniform garment began, the kind of matching jacket and pants of a dark fabric that became the men's suit. And that, that began its rise in Europe in the early 19th century. And from about the mid-19th century on, it hasn't changed. It's a standard garment. Uh, that that is a is a manifestation of democracy. It's, it, all men dress the same, so that we cannot tell the class differences among them. That was that was how it arose, um, and really in the uh, it wasn't until the mid twentieth century, and really the, the counterculture of the nineteen sixties, uh, that this idea began to arise that the natural man uh, was the most manly man. That is a man who didn't pay any attention to his grooming, who didn't shave, who let his hair grow, uh, and who didn't uh, uh, care about his appearance. That was came hand in hand with a, with the a valuing of nature, of back to the land. Um, and even before that, if you think of male icons of the 1930s or even the 1950s, if you think of Cary Grant, if you think of Sean Connery as James Bond, the masculine ideal there was not just a man who was competent and um, uh, masculine and also maybe violent like James Bond, but who was also sophisticated, who wore uh, a nicely fitted suit, who shaved, um, who knew something about opera and which wine to pair with fish. That was a masculine ideal, the idea that one could be elegant and sophisticated and manly at the same time that kind of died in the 1960s. Uh, and again, that's, if you think of human history, that's just a tiny little blip. And of course, now we're getting back to the idea that men can be elegant and sophisticated and manly at the yeah. same time. I think family, finally the all-natural movement of the 60s and 70s is dying. Wearing itself out. Because I mean, I, I mean, I guess it seems like you talk about this in the book, <clears throat> as far as men's style go and style in general, there seems to be just, it goes in like, it's a pendulum, right? Um, yeah. It'll, one generation will rebel against the other. So I guess the yeah. baby boomers were rebelling against their Brooks brothers, suit right. wearing dads, right? Parents, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know a lot of men who think that still think that though, they're still in that natural man mode. They think why bother, right? Why yeah. do you think, you know, why is it important to care how you dress? I mean, so why do you think, uh, a man should care how he dresses and, and you are make a case, I think is interesting is that you say that our clothes are a form of art and gift to others. How so? Right. I think that you dress out of respect to people around you, and you dress not just for yourself, but to make the people around you feel valued. If I, if I am dressing carelessly or slavishly in the presence of people around me, it makes it gives them a subtle, perhaps unconscious idea that I don't take them awfully seriously. If I dress up to be in the presence of others, I, I dress up. I don't mean I'm always going to be wearing a bow tie. I just mean that I dress. Um, uh, I dress. Uh, 
cleanly and elegantly, as if I've made a choice for them, uh, then they feel valued and they feel respected. And that goes for events that you go to as well. If you dress well to go to a certain place, uh, it shows respect for that place. On a more uh, practical level for one's own, uh, uh, on a more selfish level, it helps one immensely to dress well in life because people simply treat you better. They treat you differently. And you can do this experiment. I mean, you can go to a police station um, wearing a hoodie and ask for help, or you can go wearing a suit and tie and ask for help, and you'll see what happens. Um, people wearing a suit and tie uh, are treated with more deference. They are treated with more respect. People come to them uh, to take the lead in the crisis. Uh, you may deplore that. You may think it's a bad thing. And maybe it is, but still we could use it to our advantage. And, uh, I mean, do you, like, you work from home, I imagine. Do you get up and wear a, a coat and tie every day? No, I don't. No, no I don't. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing the hoodie as I talk to you right now from my, <laughs> <laughs> from my study. And it's funny, I crave an excuse to wear nice clothes. And right. I, I do. I have a sort of opposite schedule from everybody else because I work at home. What I what happens is I when I finish my work day at, at five or six o'clock, if that's when I shave and shower, and that's when I put on a jacket and tie and I go out. So it, it's it's kind of the opposite of everyone who's coming home at that time taking that off. Um, but I very look much look forward to that moment. You know, there's a great anecdote in it's a scene in Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad when the the narrator is um, first progressing down the river into the jungle. Um, and in Africa, and the foliage starts getting dense, and the heat starts getting oppressive, and they start leaving civilization be- behind. They come to the last outpost of Belgian civilization, and it's a telegraph hut, a telegraph operator in the jungle, deep in the jungle, employed by the Belgian colonists. And he comes out to meet the boat, and he lives alone in this hut in the jungle, and he's wearing a dark suit and starch collar and tie in this intolerable heat. And the narrator wonders, why would he do that all day long there, sitting alone in the jungle? But the narrator reflects that in the vast degeneration of the land was character. (laughs) 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 That's a kind of a funny European uh, belief that that I think is sort of deep in all of us, that that, uh, we dress ourselves up as armor to fight off the decay and entropy around us. Right. I kind of like that idea. I like that idea too. And I feel too, not only do when you, I dress up well, like do others treat me differently, but like I think of myself differently. I take myself a little more serious. Yes, than when exactly, I'm, yeah. So there's days... I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm happier. I'm just happier when I'm well-dressed. I, I, I just feel I can deal with anything. I do feel that it's a kind of armor that protects me. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's days I, mean, I work from home too, so I'm typically wearing t-shirts and jeans. Um, but when I like, I, I, when I'm in that mode, like, I got to get stuff done. Like I'll dress up and, uh, yeah, it just, helps. And there's help. a psychological boost that it gives you. And I'll tell you something else too, that's important for men as they age to remember, because I'm middle-aged, I'm 52 years old and I, I'm very nervous about looking silly, trying to carry off casual or hipster clothes. Yeah. At this age, uh, I think that that one's ability to dress in casual clothes declines as one gets older because one doesn't quite have the perfect body and one doesn't have the useful glow. And so, a clever T-shirt and running shoes uh, is not as sexy on a middle-aged man with gray hair. Um, and so, I think that that it really helps one as one grows older to start moving into finer and finer quality and slightly dressier clothes. You know, I haven't given up. On social life, I still like going out to nightclubs where people are generally quite a bit younger than me. And my God, I certainly still want to be attractive to young women. But uh, I am not going to do it by dressing like a kid. If I'm going to go to a nightclub where people are largely going to be younger than me, I may well be the only person in a fitted Navy suit and tie. And that's fine with me because then I am being exactly who I am. I'm not trying to pretend I'm someone else. Uh, people can say, oh, that's the older guy, and that's cool. Um, and I feel much more confident that if I'm, than if I'm simply trying to fit in with everybody else. Gotcha. So throughout the book, uh, you mentioned that like sensuality as a quality that you should try to convey with your clothes, which I think is interesting because like whenever I dress, I never, that's like not the, I don't even think about am I looking sensual. Um, so why is that a quality men should be comfortable expressing? 
Well, yeah, and it's a tricky one because so much men's fashion uh, uh, traditionally is against sensuality, right? The, 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 the main goal of the standard men's business suit is not sensuality, it's to express sobriety, which, which is a bit at odds. And if you think of the dark colors that are standard in, in, in men's suiting, charcoal, uh, navy, and, and black, um, these come from a long tradition of professions that are meant to express sobriety. If you think, for example, of the priesthood, priests uh, from various religions around the world wear black uh, as, as an expression of asceticism and sobriety, a, a kind of distance from the pleasures of the world. In other words, an anti-sensuality. So where in this uniform do we find uh, a, a window in which to express sensuality? Well, in fabrics, um, the fabrics of men's suit are extremely uh, soft and, and delicate and silk like these days, um, in crisp cotton, um, and in the little details, the tie in particular. You know, the tie is such a weird thing. It's such, it's such, a, such, a, such, a, such a useless, practically a completely useless garment, the tie. The tie has no practical role, whatever. It is purely aesthetic. It actually evolved from a scarf in the, in the 17th century. Uh, uh, scarves were the uh, simplest way for people to keep their shirt closed at the neck. Buttons were actually quite expensive. And so there were eyelets in the shirt, um, which you would pull over your head, the V-neck, and then you'd hold it closed with a scarf. And people, particularly um, soldiers started to develop more and more elaborate ways of tying these knots of their scarves so that to show off these knots. And that's and that's where we get the origin of the tie gradually evolved. But now we don't need it to keep our shirts closed. Uh, we just need it because it's the only bit of color and a, and a very feminine kind of fabric, silk, uh, in this in this otherwise closed off sober outfit. Um, and uh, the, the tie is just like this little window on your soul uh, <laughs> because the rest of your body is completely covered up. And what about, uh, I guess, pocket squares would be another way? Pocket yeah. squares would be another way. Socks, um, uh, uh, cufflinks. Um, and, uh, and of course, men's shoes are so luxurious too. I mean, I mean they're, they're, they're extremely expensive. And um, what you're showing off when you're wearing these shoes is a kind of, a handcrafted solidity. You know, you want to you want to show um, uh, a little bit of luxury with your shoes, but in such a subtle way. You know, uh, people who don't know anything about shoes don't realize how expensive they are. They don't realize uh, what kind of labor goes into them. Uh, so that's a kind of very subtle expression of luxury. Well, it's, you know, speaking of shoes, you advocate spending a lot on shoes. I mean. I, mean, yeah, I don't advocate spending a lot of money on clothes generally. I think one can get away um, with um, a very limited budget, and I do, having lived as a freelance writer for many years. Um, shoes is the one thing I don't think you can skimp on because um, shoes are really the fundament of your outfit. They're like the root from which the whole outfit grows. And uh, again, people who are class conscious, and that tends to be people who come from the privileged classes, are the ones who notice class differences and signifies not people who don't come from those classes. That's the trick of it. Um, they recognize certain shibboleths. Um, and so they will note your shoes right away. Um, the other thing is if you spend a lot of money on shoes, they'll last many years. Um, and they tend not to go in and out of fashion the way suit uh, shapes do. And so it's really, it's really worth your while. So, I mean, what, uh, if a guy is like wanting, wanting to upgrade his wardrobe, uh, what's like the the go-to dress shoe that he should probably make his first investment in? Uh, you Okay, well, you need um, one pair of... Uh, your very first shoe would be one pair of black leather lace-up shoes. Uh, that's an Oxford-style shoe. Now, there are various variations on the style, but it should be as simple as possible. You could have a toe cap or not. And my thing, and this is a lot of people think this is a bit too extravagant, but my thing is they must have a leather sole. The leather sole makes them expensive. That means they're going to be probably uh, over 250 maybe $300. Um, and uh, the point about the leather sole is you know, people can recognize it. It looks good. You could put on, take it to a cobbler and put a small rubber, a thin rubber layer over it so that it never wears out. You can keep replacing that rubber layer. Um, and those shoes will, will last you forever. Um, so that would be your first pair. 
Now, unfortunately, black shoes are kind of going out of fashion, as you probably noticed, that more and more people with suits are wearing brown shoes. This has really been the style for the, for the last 10 years. Um, and so your second pair of shoes um, should be brown or burgundy. Um, they should also be plain, uh, although uh, with brown shoes, uh, you could go, the most, most ornate thing you can do is go to a brogue. A brogue is the is the shoe with the um, uh, patterns made of punched holes in it. Um, that's called broguing. Um, uh, or tooling, that's called tooled leather. Um, and so that would be that would be your second pair. Gotcha. So basically, you need black black and brown leather soles, lace up, not so much. Okay. Your third pair would be a pair of slip-on ankle boots, I would say, like Chelsea boots, which would be very useful for casual clothing. Okay. Very good. Now, and what about suits? And I think you can kind of lay out like a, a suit ladder. I mean, a lot of guys, right. when uh, they're thinking, okay, I got to get it. Most guys don't have a suit, which I, I'm surprised by this because like yeah. a suit's so useful because yeah. you can wear it to job it interviews is, yeah. or a funeral or a wedding. Um, so for an all-purpose suit, for guys buying his first suit, what what color should he go for? Right. There's only two you can choose from. And yeah, I'm giving you a chiller choice of navy or charcoal. So charcoal is a very dark gray, not quite black. Now, uh, either of those are appropriate for your first suit. You choose whichever you think matches your coloring best. But um, those suits are both very, very versatile. Uh, they could be worn in the day or in the evening. The reason I wouldn't choose black is that black tends to look a little bit cheap. Uh, I don't know why that is, um, but it's just not um, It's just not a very respectable suit. It looks like uh, Reservoir Dogs, like the guys. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it looks a bit gangstery. It shows lint very badly, and it can be a bit shiny, and there's just something wrong about it. I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but um, you need something that's dark but not quite black. Now, it's very important that your first suit be dark, even if you live in a warm place like Los Angeles. I think that um, uh, a light suit... Uh, is not at all versatile and is going to look silly uh, and casual in certain situations. The dark suit is much more versatile. You get, once you have two suits, once you have a navy and a charcoal, then you can move on to buying a summer suit uh, in a lighter color. Uh, don't get light gray until you've really got a bunch of suits. Now, those the, the, the navy and the charcoal can be paired with an almost infinite variety of shirts and ties. Uh, and again, black or brown shoes, depending on how dressy you want to be. Uh, traditionally, a black shoe is the most formal, although even that is changing. You know, recently here in Canada, we just had an election and a new prime minister was elected, and he is a very young prime minister. He's in his 40s. Mm-hmm. Um, and he shocked uh, everyone by going to his inauguration ceremony in a navy suit and brown shoes. I think this was the first time that it ever been done. And a lot of people complained that it seemed disrespectful and informal, but that's that's the way things were going. It was, it was, for, it was a bit for us uh, like the moment when John F. Kennedy showed up at his inauguration in 1961 without a hat. I mean, now that was, right. was, was quite a daring step. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. You talk about this in the book. I mean, this is kind of going off the point of the history of men's style. Like, usually the changes in style are made by political leaders. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's like a, a way you're supposed to do things. And I guess the uh, Windsor, you know, he was like the guy who right. kind of propagated the Windsor knot. And then like he, yeah. one of the, I forgot, one of the kings in England, he started wearing things a little more casually and people were stunned that he did it. And then, but then a year later, that's what everyone was doing. Well, yeah. I mean, probably the most famous example of that would be um, would be Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's son, who became Edward the Seventh. He was um, a daring guy in that he behaved like a bit of a playboy, and he um, went to racetracks and he hung around with actresses and Americans, and uh, and so people were interested in his lifestyle because he was something of a celebrity, and so people started following his clothing. He had this. Um, uh, their house in Scotland, uh, uh, Balmoral, and he loved to go spend a lot of time there because he liked to shoot and hunt. And so he started wearing plaid, which was a Scottish influence. And plaid became all the rage in Victorian England, uh, really because of Prince Albert. That's why we have so much plaid in our wardrobes now. It comes from his adventures in Scotland. He also had a little bit of a, a, a weight problem, and he liked to eat a lot. And 
he would wear a, a waistcoat, a, a vest, uh, as part of his suit with many buttons. And apparently at the end of his meals, he would be so stuffed he'd unbutton the last button on his vest, on his waistcoat. And this became uh, a fashion. And to this day, we never do out the bottom button of our waistcoat, just the same way we don't do up the bottom button of our suit jacket. This is all Prince Albert's influence. And then uh, the, uh, the next uh, would-be king, who was Edward VIII, who abdicated and became the Duke of Windsor, was um, a, uh, a very, very popular fashion plate. The popular papers were always uh, photographing his style. And of course, this was just a time when uh, photographic magazines were first becoming popular. And so um, he was photographed everywhere, um, always wearing elegant, matty suits. And both of those guys did a lot to casualize men's clothing. They started toning down some of the more, more formal wear. So, for example, uh, uh, Prince Albert, uh, at, that, at that time, one would wear a white tie to dinner in the evening. That is, a long tailcoat and a white tie and a white waistcoat, the most formal outfit there is. And at Balmoral, he started having more casual dinners where he would wear a shorter jacket um, and a black tie, which was very dressy down. And that became the modern tuxedo. It's um, all uh, going less formal. So, I mean, if, if if royalty was the thing, the the, the group that dictated style changes or fashion styles for for men, what's our royalty today? I mean, who are the men that drive the changes in men's style? Well, obviously, it's it's celebrities. It's it's um, it's popular entertainers. It's singers. Um, it's actors and singers more than anything. Um, and there's been a, a great revolution against uh, convention and tradition. Um, that's that's really democratized fashion. Um, and so the influences are coming from everywhere now. I don't think you can say there's any one uh, there's there's any one source that one looks to on on how to dress. Um, and that makes. That, that, that's better for the world generally and that it makes it a more democratic place with fewer class barriers and shibboleth. Um, at the same time, it means it makes it a little bit more confusing for men who are trying to decide how to dress. And yeah. There are various movements going on of, that could only be described as conservatism that are, that are uh, dandy movements um, that are encouraging men. Um, and African-American men in particular in the United States uh, um, uh, to uh, espouse fine and conventional clothing, suits and ties and pocket squares in a very colorful and, and flamboyant manner. There's an interesting movement in Africa going on right now that you've probably heard of called the Sapo. The Sapo uh, were a group of uh, very underprivileged men from the Congo uh, who spent all of their money on hand-tailored suits and ties in very bright colors. Um, and leather shoes and all kinds of accoutrements like canes and hats. And, and they look like very old fashioned dandies. And it's a form of social rebellion for them. It's a form of kind of, uh, trying to move themselves out of, of, of the sense of, uh, lack of privilege that they have to be noticed in the world. And those guys, uh, have, uh, have presences in other European capitals, uh, like Paris in particular. So there's all kinds of strange explosions going on right now of um, defi- kind of a defiant interest uh, in a luxurious and flamboyant way of men's dressing. And, I mean, and you, we wrote this book a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, are you surprised by some of these changes that are happening or did, did you kind of see it was like the writing on no, the wall? No, I'm not. I mean, I did, I did say we're, we're emerging <laughs> out of this period of where in which we value the all natural um, uh, and we have started to embrace artistry and the an artifice uh, again. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I could, I could, I could kind of see this coming. Um, I mean, I didn't see coming uh, counter movements like normcore, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I mean, there will always be a counterweight to anything, anything like this. Right. Um, and for our listeners who don't aren't like normcore is like when people dress like Jerry Seinfeld, basically, right? Normcore is, I, you know, what I, it may be a purely fictitious 
movement invented by the media. The, the idea of the metrosexual was largely invented by the media, actually, as well. Um, the actual metrosexual was rarely seen in the wild, more in the pages of newspapers and magazines. I think the same goes for Normcore. Uh, the idea is that the most fashionable and cool of hipsters in the urban centers of North America, and particularly in Brooklyn, um, uh, decided to reject fashion so completely that they began to embrace a kind of anti-fashion which involved deliberately ugly and bland clothes. So to look uh, not like a hipster, but like a tourist from the Midwest um, <laughs> with running shoes and oh, and, and plain jeans, maybe acid wash jeans and a t-shirt with a logo on it um, and maybe a windbreaker, uh, that's the idea of the the blandest and most unnoticeable of all. That would be the highest fashion of all, and that's uh, called non-core. Uh, yeah, irony. You know what? Yeah, it's, it's just it makes my brain deep, hurt. <laughs> deep levels of cool, yeah. Right. Uh, well, I'm curious. I mean, what do you think the future is of men's style? Because it seems like it's been stuck, like it's sort of the same thing for the past a hundred odd years, a little hundred plus years, where it's a, a suit, yeah. white shirt, tie. I mean, are we ever going to be move beyond that, or is this? Are we kind of reached the isn't apex? That, isn't that fascinating? Like, I mean, it's I really, really weird because, like, I mean, you look, you look at like just like in the revolutionary times, like they were wearing like uh, breeches and like you know, yeah. frock coats and like these like, you know pl- you know very flamboyant things, wigs, and like we just we we're done. And I guess it's like I don't know what's going decadence. Like we just we reached the apex and we're just going to stick there. It's it's um. It's very strange how long this has stayed without any change at all. Um, and um, that Western standard, the Western standard stood has spread to the rest of the world as well. Um, so it's incredibly powerful and, and fixed. And you know what? Fashion itself has been trying to fight it against it for decades. So you get high-end fashion designers, runway fashion, every year doing shows in which outrageous and groundbreaking outfits are thrown down the runway men in completely crocheted outfits, men in skirts. I mean, for how many years have you been hearing there's about to be a revival of men wearing skirts? I've been hearing this since the 1980s. I remember going to fashion shows when I lived in Paris as a student in 1985 and seeing men in skirts wear that walk down the runway and thinking, aha, finally men are going to wear skirts. Well, every five years we see someone say it's coming back and it never, ever, ever does <laughs> because uh, fashion is always at odds with this, with this, a uh, very powerful force of convention in the sense that a man must look a certain way in order to play a certain role. And I I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, I, I think that um, certainly our ideas of gender are slowly changing. Our ideas that, that, that gender is fixed and has to be defined in a certain way is slowly changing. So maybe we'll see some more androgyny uh, in men's fashion in future years, I think that's gradually happening, but not nearly as fast as anyone would have expected. So I don't know the answer to that, and I, and I, <laughs> and I can't give it. I think you should go and buy suits now. They'll be good for the next 20 years. I can there tell you, you that. There you go. And I mean, you talk about going back to sort of the practicalities of style. Um, you, you mentioned you don't really... Sp- you don't advocate spending a lot on clothing. Um, so should guys invest in like a custom made suit or made to measure off? I mean, what, if they're buying clothes, should they not feel bad going to a, a good department store that has good, good brand suits there and buying that and getting it tailored to fit or should they go custom made? Um, that's a good question. And both are good. Um, in, nowadays in most cities, there are, there are, uh, Brand new business is developing as we speak and proliferating, uh, specializing in custom suits. And what they're doing is they they go and they will take their uh, they will take your measurements, and then they will send those measurements off to Asia somewhere. It will either be China or India yeah. or Pakistan or or, or Vietnam, uh, where there are tailors working, um, and they will cut a certain pattern, but to your size. It's it's not all that different, really, from buying a suit off the rack. I mean, you're not getting um, an actual bespoke suit. You're not actually getting a suit that's cut to fit you. You're getting a slight modification on an existing pattern. It's still in a very, very good deal. Uh, and those suits are hardly more than suits off the rack from a great department store. So um, uh, I would say, yes, uh, it is uh, uh, that, that suit probably will fit you a bit better, and it's not a whole lot more expensive. And so I would get yourself um, uh, a made-to-measure suit. 
the, the top end tailors tend to distinguish, and they all have a different vocabulary, but, but here they tend to distinguish between made to measure and bespoke. So made to measure means what I've just described. They do give you um, a slightly different size of an existing pattern. A bespoke suit is something much higher end, and it's where they're going to start from scratch and, and draw you a suit and cut it for you. Um, and I know here in Toronto, a, a suit like that will start at about five thousand um, dollars. So that's not what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, I would also say that there's nothing wrong with buying cheap, quick fashion from trendy chains like, say, Zara or H&M, um, because uh, it makes one feel good to have a nasty suit that's in fashion. It's not going to last you forever. It's not going to be the best quality, but that's okay because the style is not going to last forever. And I'm talking about suits that are going to cost you, say, three, three, four hundred dollars um, I think that, that uh, if you're strapped for cash, it's really worth it to have one of those. Mm-hmm. Buy a new one every couple of years. Uh, spend a lot of money on your shoes, on your shirt, and on your tie, and nobody will notice that you have a cheap suit on. Gotcha. Okay, great advice there. Well, Russell, besides writing about style, you also uh, are a uh, write short stories. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your latest collection of short stories and where listeners can find out more about your work? Yeah, I, I, I'm a novelist, and I've written uh, several novels. And, um, uh, my last novel was a book called Girl Crazy, um, and my most recent collection is a book of short stories, and it's called Confidence. And it's about urban people who live in cities and have affairs and do terrible things to each other. And so it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a funny and sad book. And you can get it on Amazon. Um, but you can also um, check my website, which is russellsmith.ca. Fantastic. Well, Russell Smith, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. My guest today was Russell Smith. He's the author of the book, Men's Style, The Thinking Man's Guide to Dress, and that's available on Amazon.com. And you can find more information about Russell's work at russellsmith.ca.